Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for letting me present um, the out briefing from the workshop we had in uh, May of this year in Boulder, Colorado, and Bucherley. It was in the future of Earth, Earth system reanalysis. And uh, organizing was organized by US Clivar. And the organizing committee included um, speakers from NOAA, NASA, um, uh, academia, and uh, from uh, non government organizations. The focus of the workshop was uh, aimed at developing a so shared scientific, technological, and applicational vision for the future of US reanalysis effort. I'll just say that the reason we focused on the US was because we felt that uh, even though the scientific problem is obviously uh, wider than the United States, we felt that the organizational, we might get more organizational traction if we focus on the United States. So a couple of slides kind of introduce this audience to practice of reanalysis. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar, but just want to bring you all to the same page. So reanalysis combines observations um, uh, with modern Earth system models to generate a special and temporally complete history of the Earth system. So here's an example from a Gil Compost paper, where there is sparse observations uh, over, of surface pressure over the United States, Atlantic, Europe, and you can reconstruct the surface pressure or the flow field over the Northern Hemisphere. And you can see that over the Pacific, where the observations are sparse, there is really fewer details you can reconstruct. The uses of reanalysis, as you're well aware, are widespread. It started as a practice in the numerical weather prediction community that was used to initialize reforecasts to calibrate and evaluate real time um, forecasting system. It's also, of course, widely used by uh, researchers to uh, as a reconstruction of past climates using sparse observations. It also provides an estimate of things that we cannot observe directly, like transport fluxes and budgets. Um, it provides historical conditions uh, for infrastructure projects like solar farms, wind farms, um, coastal development, and increasingly it provides training data sets for machine learning applications. So a few things about uh, uh, reanalysis and ongoing activity, it's not one and done. So quality of reanalysis continuously improves due to better models, more compute power, and improved reconstruction of historic observations. So a couple of um, illustrations from uh, Hans Herbach uh, paper on era five. So as you look at the quality of uh, reanalysis, as you go back in time, the quality decreases because there's fewer observations. But if you look at the improvement between generations of reanalysis, this improvement is uh, really staggering. Um, it's compared to several decades of improvement in observations. And another aspect to reanalysis that, spent, that uh, the community spends a lot of time on is the reprocessing of historical observations. So if we look at uh, just this one geostationary data from era five, you can see that a lot of the data was added to era five compared to era interim by recovering it from archives. Some of the data was reprocessed, the data in blue, and some data was removed because it was deemed to be bad data. So let's, uh, before I go on to the vision for the future, let's uh, kind of quickly review how a um, data set like Era 5 comes to be. So it starts with uh, observations of sea surface temperature. Most of them will come from satellites and, and Standalone SST analysis is created. And this uh, SST analysis does not use dynamical models. And this SST analysis is used to drive atmospheric analysis or atmospheric models, combines uh, atmospheric observations. That will be an analysis like ERA 5. And then ERA 5 like analysis is usually used to drive ocean models that produces ocean analysis. And it's this sequential uh, procedure or uncoupled reanalysis. And as we're starting to look more and more into how Earth system functions as a whole, we're starting to realize that the sequential or uncoupled way of doing things is really limiting. So for example, we know that in the tropics, we have this tropically coupled uh, waves. 
So if you look at the Hoffman diagram, they propagate uh, from west to east, I think, if I get that right. Um, and in a couple of uh, pilot tree analysis, you can see propagation consistent to what you would see in observations, but uncoupled tree analysis cannot get this uh, propagation right. So with this in mind, the workshop set the goal of uh, setting this 10-year vision uh, for a consistent tree analysis. We deliberately not use the word coupled because we thought that coupled was actually a limiting notion. So what do we mean by consistent tree analysis? It means consistent across multiple components of the Earth system, including atmosphere, ocean, ice, land, carbon, air quality, and hydrological cycles. It's consistent at, uh, in fluxes across these components. It can also close essential budgets of heat, water, and carbon. And that's all of these things we're not doing very well right now. And we have, if you go to the talks presented during the workshop, you will see documentation of how we come short. In, in terms of temporal trends, it's a known problem that uh, Reynolds is a struggle capturing temporal trends. They often introduce uh, spurious trends due to changes in the observing system. So we imagine that in 10 year time, the next generations of Reynolds should be more robust in their estimates of trend, trends and be robust to changes in the observing system. And one of the aspects to it is provide estimates of uncertainty that reflect the changes in the observing system. Another part of a consistent vision is technological. I think it's essential with the data volumes and the type of analysis that the modern science and modern society is asking us that we collocate product storage with compute. And we want to do it consistent across different families of free analysis. And finally, we want to have a consistent and or common error matrix and diagnostics that can help guide development and evaluation of future products. So we want to break this barrier where reanalysis is released and scientific community looks at it for several years, comes up with papers of how this reanalysis is good or bad and gets feedback years late into the development cycle. This cycle should really be much tighter so reanalysis can improve faster. So a question, obvious question that came up during the meeting is, do we need one reanalysis to rule them all? And the consensus was reached that striving for a single reanalysis product that integrates all components of the Earth system, satisfies the diverse user needs, is infeasible and would likely degrade the accuracy of individual Earth system components. So as alternative, we came up with a suite of reanalysis um, um, strategy for development. And maybe the most appropriate way to look at this uh, slide is to start from the middle of it, from observations. And if we go backwards in time, right now we're in a more than a record, which uh, has uh, very advanced satellites, has Argo profiles in the oceans, has uh, very accurate GPS measurements of the upper atmosphere. But as we start going into the end of the 20th century, the satellite record start to thin out and really uh, drops off in 1970s. From 1950s to 1970s, you have a, a maturing record of upper air measurements, so things like uh, radio zones, aircraft. But as you start going to early 20th century, 19th century, you're really left with surface measurements. So another way to look at this timeline is to look at what kind of applications you want to support. If you want to understand climate extreme trends, you probably want a reanalysis that goes hundreds of years back in time. For climate baseline, you might want to have a hundred year reanalysis, but practically based on constraints of past uh, records of data, you probably can uh, extend it to 1950s as something that um, will be a, can provide a consistent estimate of uh, climate. If you want to do S2S reforecasts, you need to extend to several decades, probably covering early satellite record. By contrast, if you are concerned about uh, weather reforecast, you might want to actually focus your work on a modern record. 
uh, such as the 21st century. And finally, for energy and infrastructure, um, you want to cover at least 20 years because it's a typical planning horizon for infrastructure projects. But for really large projects like hydroelectric you know, dams and water storage, you might want to go back to past historic events and maybe go as far back as into the middle of 20th century. So taking in consideration these uh, constraints and observational records and uh, driving process from applications, we suggested that the following suite of reanalysis should be targeted and produced. So the backbones of this suite will be the sparse input that covers uh, hundreds of years to the beginning of surface uh, measurement uh, record, and a full input that probably covers at least through the satellite era and with a possible extension 1950s. So something similar to what era five has done. Both of these uh, uh, backbone reanalysis should be produced with uh, fully coupled state-of-the-art models of atmosphere, ocean, ice, and land. And this backbone reanalysis then can form as a baseline for regional efforts, something that we actually don't do right now in the United States. For the carbon stock reanalysis that will introduce uh, biogeochemical components in all in land, ocean, atmosphere composition and air quality, and there will always be a research efforts that will push the envelope. So for an example of such effort is ECHO, that tries to have a consistent estimate of transport in the ocean. To um, really bring this vision forward, we realized that some shared infrastructure in the United States is needed. There's a lot of shared modeling components in the United States happening already, such as FS3 dynamical core, for the atmosphere, MOM6, for ocean, sea ice, size for ice, ESMF coupler, CPPP, atmospheric physics drivers. We're converging on the shared data simulation infrastructure, such as JEDI. However, what we're missing right now is a shared and open database of inputs. So for example, full, full suite of observation for coupled reanalysis. It will also be beneficial to have uh, forcing and boundary conditions, such as SST products, CO2 forcings, land use databases, shared diagnostics and aerometrics, and common access pattern for products. Some that will help us to collocate products and compute. Um, to wrap up, a couple of scientific challenges. So reanalysis with coupled models is in its infancy. We need to work on reducing biases and closing budgets, something that we don't do very well right now. We need to account for storage and flux of carbon between the components and land modeling um, was identified as a leading challenge for carbon storage. We need to do a better job of representation of droughts, precipitation, and water movement and storage between earth system components. We need to do a more realistic representation of tropospheric ozone in support of um, air quality reanalysis. And there is always a, a continuous work on reduction of systematic model errors. To summarize, um, we realize that uh, in the United States, a multi-agency sustained effort is needed to fulfill on this 10-year vision. And where we come short in the US as a community is that we need new methods for interagency collaboration that can share limited resources. Um, an example would be something like EU Copernicus Climate Services, but we realize that might not translate directly to US reality. But an entity like that might be needed to fully realize the potential of U.S. reanalysis enterprise. Thank you. And I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Sergey. That was a very um, ambitious program for the next 10 years. Let me see if we have any questions yet in the job pad. Not yet, but I remind you that you can Write your questions. I would start with this with a question about the distinction that you guys in the in the workshop made between coupled and consistent. So, if if we depart from the the most ambitious case would be to create a model of the Earth system and do the reanalysis with that model. Consistent means 
all if I understand well the ways to achieve the same result you would have with an ideal full holistic earth model or what is consistent here? yeah uh, it's a great question Javier so if you look at there's there's two aspects to it so if you look practically at these timelines you realize for example that um, something like a carbon renalysis a composition renalysis they're really tied up with availability of modern satellites so it doesn't but you know the problems you encounter if you try to run a full input analysis like Euro 5, a lot of it has to do with how you deal with uh, really old satellite observations, kind of pre-modern era. Mm -hmm. um, while if you're trying to get the best carbon analysis, you're focusing on a modern era. So the different problems. So if you so it doesn't make sense to run a full carbon reanalysis and air quality reanalysis, you know, in 20th century, because we don't mm. have good data to support it. So that's why it was decided that targeting this fully, 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 fully coupled system doesn't really make sense. And another aspect to it is we realize that consistent extends far beyond strongly coupled. And, mm -hmm. you know, you can be fully coupled and you still have bad fluxes or you do not close budgets. Why not? So it's- It, it also includes the method itself besides the sources of information. You, you can do all of that and still don't close budgets. Yeah, 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 that's true. So that's you should true. focus on closing budgets instead of being obsessed about specific coupling configuration. Does that help? Thank Have you. It? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that's, that's clear. Now, there is another question from uh, Lars Nerger. He asks about what is the perspective on DA methods used for reanalysis? It says there is some variety and different methods produce, uh, different products focus on different methods. Does this pose problems? Um, I think there is a lot of research that needs to be done if we really want to address these scientific problems in this 10-year vision or if we go back to the last uh, uh, slide that talks about um, scientific problems behind reanalysis. A healthy way is to explore different methods how to achieve these ambitious goals. And it's healthier to focus on scientific goals rather than on a specific method. I think. Mm. There is still time for maybe one or two more questions. There is another one from uh, some anonymous writer. Please remember to write your name. Uh, in the joke, but it says, are there any advantages for a dynamically consistent ocean reanalysis compared to the ocean reanalysis using sequential simulation methods, specifically for the deep and abyssal oceans? And uh, in parentheses for the dynamically consistent ocean reanalysis, uh, Fang Lu mentions the ocean estimate using adjoint method. So again, it, it comes back to so, method. Is it, is it better to have the adjoint than the sequential? Um, so, you know, we, we did realize that 90% of users or more would actually want, you know, this top tier of reanalysis produced with more con conventional sequential methods. However, there are research questions that a reanalysis like ECO is uniquely posed to uh, address. And at the same time, ECO, you know, might not be great support of uh, wind farm development, offshore wind farm development, right? Um, so I think again, there is room for both venues. And ideally, as we get better at sequential methods, 
you know, if our ambition is to close budgets, you know, so things that ECWA does well is closing budgets, right? So we should yeah. figure out how to do it better in the rest of the products and not in just this very specialized product like ECHO. But that's my personal viewpoint. It's not a viewpoint of the workshop. Thank you. There, are, unfortunately, we have run out of questions, but out of time. There are two more questions in the joke pad. So if you could uh, answer them directly there, then then people can read your answers. Both who asked the questions and and all of the other attendees. So thank you very much, Sergey, again for your participation. And now.